I want to welcome everyone to the succinct seminar. We're pleased you're joining. Um, as the seminars are given, you can feel free, if you wish, to post questions that could be addressed at the end of each talk. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Fuchsia Hoover. Dr. Hoover got her um, undergraduate degree of BS in mechanical engineering from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. And then she went to Purdue where she um, also got uh, an MS degree um, uh, in biological engineering, looking at analysis of green <coughs> roof systems. And continuing with that theme, she finished her PhD at Purdue, looking at barriers to implementation of, of stormwater um, management systems. Um, she, after that, she went to work with EPA for some, a research project. This was the National Academy's National Research Council in Cincinnati and worked on stormwater issues there as well before she came to Sink. She um, is very actively publishing her papers uh, since arriving to Sink. She's published three papers already. Uh, and prior to that, she published some work on corn-based ethanol, but most of her focus now is on stormwater management and green infrastructure. Um, one interesting paper that she um, has, has out now is one looking at privilege and power in US urban parks and open space areas, green space areas um, during the double crisis we're all facing right now of anti-black racism and COVID-19. So with that, we really look forward to your talk, Fuchsia. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My talk today is going to be on dissecting the decision making process of green infrastructure, and it's based on my current work at Sysync. So just a brief overview, I'm first going to share some affirmations that I like to start all of my talks with, and I invite you all to sit with each statement, um, think about how it makes you feel. And then I'll go into a brief overview of a green infrastructure and its relationships to the different aspects in which I look at it. So planning within cities, stormwater, and then ecosystem services. And then I'll talk specifically about the project that I'm working on as a postdoc at Sysync and some of our initial um, results and implications. So first, I want to say all Black Lives Matter, and that includes Black trans lives, um, those who are incarcerated, as well as re-entry citizens. Um, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is something that needs to be said repeatedly, particularly given um, the summer and the time that we're in. I also want to affirm that disability rights are human rights. Uh, this year, we're celebrating 30 years of the American Disabilities Act, and so while there are many things that we have made in terms of progress for inclusion of those who are disabled, there is still a very long way to go. I also want to say that it's important to respect indigenous sovereignty and knowledge, both particularly as a scientist who is thinking about the environment and new ways of approaching how we plan, how we relate to space and vegetation and our surroundings. Um, and then lastly, you know, connected to all of these things, uh, for me is that science is not objective. We absolutely bring in who we are and our experiences as part of the questions we ask and the methods that we use. And so I think that's something that is often not talked about um, and, and, you know, sometimes forgotten. So moving into urban planning and green infrastructure, um, we really see green infrastructure becoming this term in the early 2000s. So, you know, prior to that, um, there were there were a few publications, but not a whole lot. And this uh, recent work that is forthcoming by a colleague of mine, um, they looked at the way that cities talk about and define green infrastructure. And what they found were 153 unique definitions. Um, within those, stormwater is a, a dominating way that green infrastructure is talked about. But essentially, you know, green infrastructure is a type of engineered practice that uses either materials, technologies, or vegetation to, in some way, 
um, manage stormwater and rainfall or provide a, a particular type of amenity. Uh, the picture on the bottom right you see is a bioretention with a curb cut to capture the stormwater that's coming down the street. And then um, the sidewalk is actually a pervious pavers. So that allows rainfall to infiltrate into the ground as well. So this is just one example of what it may look like if you're out for a walk. So diving a bit more into my particular area of the relationship between green infrastructure, which I'll refer to as GI moving forward and stormwater, is thinking about, about it as a management tool and the way that you know it's specifically been defined by the Environmental Protection Agency. And the, there's a definition on the, the bottom for you. And that while that is pulled from the HR bill that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, passed through the house, um, it's lifted directly from the definition that the EPA uses. And so this, for the most part, has been kind of the driving force of how a lot of cities may adapt to green infrastructure and how they define it and the way that they approach it. And in terms of ecosystem services, because um, this is a term I'll be using throughout the presentation as well, you can think of those as just benefits that people receive either directly or indirectly. And so I have a couple examples um, provided of what a direct ecosystem service might be versus an indirect ecosystem service. Um, using you know, tomatoes from a garden that you are eating and it's giving you nutrients, that's a direct resource versus the nutrients that helps grow that tomato. And then, you know, we also have um, kind of these four categorizations of ecosystem services, which is used quite often across both ecology and planning and, you know, hydrology as well, um, agriculture. And this study defined it using these four different ways. Um, and again, you know, providing some examples to help you conceptualize what, what a supporting ecosystem service might be, right? So that's connecting back to that indirect service. Um, whereas, you know, cultural could be the look, like, do you, do you add flowers because you think they look beautiful? And then finally, there are many different ways that ecosystem services are evaluated. One of the most common ways is through things like willingness to pay or perhaps a benefit cost analysis where folks are trying to you know, determine what is the, the monetary value of an ecosystem service. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in are other ways of valuing these spaces as well as putting GI in the context of the history of green space. So here we have three images of three different cities. And on the left, we have Los Angeles, California. And I wanna call your attention to um, the area I've highlighted in this red box, which you can see, you know, is a bit of a transition space, right? So historically, green space in, in an urban context has fallen along lines of race or income. So in the case of Los Angeles, green space has historically been tied to communities or individual residents who could afford to water and maintain that particular uh, vegetation on or in front of their property without assistance from from the city. And so with Los Angeles, we see a lot of green space being associated with higher income neighborhoods where they historically would have had those additional funds um, and also possibly time to maintain that green space. In Baltimore, Maryland, we can see um, along this, this transect where we, we notice two things. So first we see a transition into um, you know, the, the green space itself, right? So to the north of this box, now we can tell there's a lot more street trees, there's more yard space compared to the area to the south of the line and even to the, the right side, the east part, right? And then we also notice a change in the, the grid system. So this is kind of moving along that urban to exurban suburban line where we are moving out of a grid um, 
into more of you know those sloping sloping hills or sloping sidewalks meandering ways and baltimore is interesting in that it is one of the um, kind of purveyors that institutionalized something called redlining, which is at its simplest um, housing segregation by race. And so what we notice in these situations is often communities that are predominantly white tend to have um, not just more green space, but higher quality green space. And then finally, we have an example of St. Louis, Missouri, and this is an area in the north part of the city, which is um, historically and predominantly black. And in this case, we actually noticed, you know, lots of different pockets of green space, right? We have blocks of, of what aerially looks like green space. And what that actually is, is the result of uh, vacant properties that have been demolished and either, you know, left as, as grassed area or converted into um, specific kind of stormwater capture locations. And so now we have a, a different, but also still complex relationship of the prevalence of green space within a disenfranchised community. So these are all the questions that I, I'm thinking about as I'm um, working on the projects and asking the questions that I do. So the particular project that I'm focusing on thinks about, you know, is green infrastructure a universal good, given all of the things that I just showed you and the histories of those relationships, um, in what ways can we use it? And much of this work builds on the collection of data from um, my colleagues, Bigny of Grabowski and, and his team through the Cary Institute and the New School. So just, just to reiterate, you know, some of the guiding questions that I'm thinking about really have to do with the way cities place green infrastructure and the rationale that they use to do so, which often encompasses a lot of language around ecosystem services or multifunctionality, all the things that, you know, GI can bring and give to us. Um, but often in a lot of the previous work, I noticed there was a lack of explicit and clear steps towards achieving this, right? Or, or a lack of mention about the particular metrics or data that they'll use in the process. And so my, my mentor and I had this kind of overarching question of, well, how are cities determining where to locate green infrastructure practices? And what is the criteria that they are using to make those decisions? So as part of this work, we looked at city plans and sustainability plans across 100, um, 120 plans total across 20 cities in the US and Puerto Rico. And you can see they vary in size, uh, they vary in climate zone and region. And you know, part of this was really to get a sense of um, are there differences across the cities? Are there differences across regions? Are there similarities? And what are they? So this is our approach. And for those of you who um, may not be familiar or as familiar with qualitative or mixed methods um, approaches, what we did was something first called a contextual analysis, which relied on coding the plans. So coding in this case is, you know, using a, a category or a way of categorizing data. And in our case, relating it to the criteria that cities used to place green infrastructure. So we start with, you know, keyword searches in the, in the documents, right? Um, doing a keyword search for green infrastructure and tagging where that comes up. And then we look at the language that surrounds that particular um, tag. And from there, we could develop specific themes that represented the way that cities are talking about green infrastructure and the criteria that they're using. And then with my with my team, including my mentor and uh, an undergraduate honors thesis, then we're able to have conversations about, you know, whether we agree or disagree, um, do we need to expand what we're seeing into additional categories or subcategories? And then the final analysis. So to give you an idea of what this reiterative coding process looks like, one of the first things that we started with was cost, right? We, we are sure that cities are likely incorporating costs in some way. 
And then after reading through the document several times and, re, you know, for refining some of the themes, we ended up expanding cost into several subcategories to reflect the different ways that cities talk about costs, whether it be prioritizing, you know, available funding or a particular type of cost or maybe a, a cost sharing element. Um, this is what that process looks like. So ultimately, we ended up creating kind of three, three levels of um, analysis. So we had our large groups where we captured categories like cost or other things that may be related to cost, and then breaking that down into additional subcategories where needed. And these are the seven groups that we ended up um, consolidating all of these different categories into. And I won't read all of them um, here, but um, I'll, I'll remind you as we go through the results. So this is the first uh, summary of those different categories, which are listed on the right. And then at the bottom, we have those large groups. And so, you know, we can see right away that hydrology, our, our group logistics and social are the three dominating ways that cities plan to place green infrastructure. And of course, the, one of the things that I'm most interested in, right, is environmental justice aspects. So how are they placing equity or thinking about prioritizing equity and justice when they plan? And we can see it's, it's pretty small. So certainly not as big as I was hoping. But um, for the results, I will focus on the top three mentions, including um, the largest categories within those groups uh, for the sake of time. And then I'll, I'll briefly touch on environmental justice at the end. So this is the stormwater category, which was the largest category within our hydrology group. And I just wanted to give you some definitions for the, the top two highest mentions of criteria which included the storm sewer or sewer type. So that would be if it was a separated system where you have stormwater going um, in separate pipes and then you have sewage going in another, or if it was combined where you've got all everything coming into one pipe. And then runoff itself, right? So where were the physical locations where runoff was occurring or maybe there were efforts to specifically target um, managing runoff in some way. So when thinking about the implications of equity, you know, we again see stormwater as a primary driver, which isn't surprising given the dominant definition of green infrastructure. And we see that a lot of the criteria is largely based on characteristics of that physical environment, right? So whether that be where, um, where are our large parking lots or areas where water can't infiltrate into the ground, or maybe they're using some type of modeling tool to determine where the hot spots are or the sewer type. And so, you know, at first glance, this could be promising and that oftentimes, uh, low income or minority neighborhoods are more likely to be located in lower elevation locations along, you know, floodplains, places where um, runoff and flooding may, may be more likely to occur. And in this sense, they could be then prioritized. But we also see that that could be oppositional to the neighborhood or community needs or preferences. You know, thinking back to that example of St. Louis, if green space is something that they have, uh, you know, are plentiful in because of a loss of housing, then what if housing is actually the biggest concern for that community and they don't want or need more green space? And so the challenge is that a seemingly objective solution um, could actually lead to further environmental inequities and injustices. So the next category of feasibility, which was under that logistics section, um, looked at things like ownership and space availability, performance. Um, vacancy was also something that was highlighted by plans in terms of uh, preferencing green infrastructure where, where there are high rates of vacancy. 
And one of the things about the ownership, you know, that's that was pretty straightforward. It's, you know, public or privately owned. The, the dominant way that cities next looked at where to place green infrastructure. And within this, you know, um, so this is an example um, that I also wanted to bring in of leveraged opportunities, which was the the second part or the second category of logistics. <clears throat> And it's areas, this is a quote from one of the plans, areas with existing um, GGI um, is um, green infrastructure. And I don't remember what the second G stands for, but um, I can tell you later if you're really curious. Um, <clears throat> and the potential for economic development, right? So thinking about where, where are multiple things happening at once that we can add green infrastructure into. And, you know, when we think about both this idea of leveraged opportunities, um, as well as ownership, we really see that there, there's limited opportunity for participation or involvement from residents, um, as well as uh, efforts to place GI where projects already exist. And from an equity standpoint, you know, some of the implications of, of this include communities then being excluded from capital planning projects or comprehensive plans that are already in motion or have already been drafted, you know, maybe years prior. And, you know, when we think about kind of the histories of, of racism in this country or segregation, um, disinvestment, right, we, we know that historically communities of color, low income communities are excluded from some of those big capital investment plans. And so not having independent funding lines for green infrastructure and relying on the ability to, you know, kind of tack it into something else or uh, fold it into an existing project has some really serious implications for excluding and further disenfranchising those communities. So one of the um, most interesting for me being the, the social group, and this is the community category within that. And so we see, you know, by far outreach, education, um, and even recreation are some of the largest ways that cities would place green infrastructure in their criteria. But when we look at how cities were defining these things, that's where it gets a little interesting. And so we see for outreach, you know, this often looks like um, prioritizing placement of green infrastructure based on folks who had called in to report areas of flooding or some type of prior engagement with the city or maybe a department within the city. And then the education component was actually the prioritization or predominantly the prioritization of green infrastructure on or near school property. <clears throat> so those would be, you know, schools, public schools or board of education locations. And, you know, when we think about what what that means in the context of equity, what we really see is this, this passive engagement with the community or neighborhoods where all of the, the engagement component relies on some type of prior participation um, or some type of existing partnership that already was present before they decided to do this. And because there's also a lack of explicitly stated outreach to you know, minoritized residents or neighborhoods in terms of if we're interested in these folks, this is how we will reach out to them or how we'll fold them into the planning decision-making process. Residents are certainly less likely um, to be included because uh, oftentimes those who are disenfranchised are already less likely to participate, right? Because there are other things like time, money, knowledge, or even, you know, interest and empowerment that are all prerequisites to being able to participate. And so then it's kind of this, um, you know, self, uh, I can't remember the name that I'm trying to think of, right? But this cycle in which the folks that you are trying to prioritize aren't participating because they can't, or maybe they've been uh, barred in some way in the past, and, and you're not intentionally going and seeking those, those groups out to change that. 
And this is a quote that I wanted to share from one of the plans um, that, that speaks to this, right? And that these partnerships were formed as a result of complaints and this particular model neighborhood initiative um, that the city was beginning, you know, all the neighborhoods involved were based on these existing partnerships. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the environmental justice criteria because certainly there were a couple cities that did have a specific language around it and it showed up in three ways. The first was this idea of distributional elements of environmental amenities or disamenities. Um, and then I, I provide quotes from the plans to help you kind of conceptualize this, which is really just, you know, where where are the things? Where are our trees? Where are our, bar our bike lanes? Um, you know, which neighborhoods don't have them? And then we can put them in there. The second way was referring to some other institutional process of justice or injustice. So, you know, there was a recognition of identifying areas with historical and current underinvestment. So, you know, where, where the communities that have been left up of those capital um, planning projects or comprehensive plans. And then the last one was referencing specific data that they would use to identify at risk or highly vulnerable neighborhoods. So maybe they, you know, specifically say we want to prioritize communities of color or low income communities. But again, you know, this still um, didn't have the kind of solid concrete language that we would need in order to be able to translate it to this is now what that looks like at the implementation level. Okay, that's right. So I'm going to skip for the sake of time. Um, and, and lastly, I just want to, you know, go back to that idea of placing green infrastructure in context and thinking about what all of these things mean in, in, in the context of those histories and what we're seeing in the plans thus far. And particularly thinking about this desire to use green infrastructure as a social cure, right? And that we we see a lot of the cities talking about GI as this way to to address low income, you know, poverty or um, some of the health disparities that we see, and not having a, a you know specific explicit criteria to to even prioritize those particular metrics within the plans. And so really, in terms of moving forward, um, you know, it's these three points are, of, of course, things that I think existed outside of this project, but even more so have been affirmed based on our results. And then the other thing that I'm really starting to think about now is what are the other systems that we can use to evaluate neighborhood needs and think about green infrastructure placement because the, the current models that exist and that we're using aren't working, particularly since they weren't built for thinking about equity and justice in the first place. So I'll end there to leave time for questions. And I appreciate you all uh, for listening. And if you want to reach out personally for more questions, you have my information there. Thank you, Fuchsia. That was very interesting. Um, so we, I'm opening up the floor for <coughs> questions. And I see I have a couple. Um, first, Kelly Hondula asks, if you could talk a little more about whether the sustainability plans are a good indicator of where and how GI funds end up, GI and funds end up getting implemented. In terms of, you know, policy and plans, the comprehensive plans are going to be the, the strongest ones in determining what is actually implemented. Um, you know, oftentimes, cities will have, have exited in a whole host of different plans, right? But the comprehensive ones um, or kind of the strategic plans are the, you know, the, um, what is it, the, the wheel hits the road. Um, and we do have, I didn't, I didn't share it because of time, but we do have a breakout of the, the groups and categories across plan type so that we can see within these particular types of plans, what is being prioritize what is the criteria uh, and so that's that's going to be um, 
where our work also heads now that this initial phase is done in looking at you know the plan breakdown um, and and more so within the cities as well. There's two questions that are sort of related. Uh, Rachel Mason asks, has environmental justice been sort of overlooked because people making the plans are generally privileged that they enough they don't see the problem? Or has e, have EJ issues been actively resisted? And then Ryan wanted to know a little bit about the historical processes of exclusion and systematically uh, racist practices. To answer Rachel, yes, it's both. It's a both and. Um, and part of that, I don't know, my cat feeder's going off if you <laughs> hear that. But, um, you know, I think both the questions speak to kind of the way environmental justice has been perceived. And, you know, this is partly why one of my affirmations is science is not objective, right? And that includes planning and engineering because some of the histories include things like, um, you know, highway construction. The, in particular, the cities that have highways going directly through them, right, were intentionally built through minoritized communities because they were devalued um, and valued less than, than probably white communities or areas where there were, you know, um, white businesses, right? And so there is, there is certainly intentionality in the histories of the way we've organized space and location. Um, and then I think there's also ways in which, similar to the Black Lives Matter movement, right, where environmental justice hasn't always been perceived as something good or something that should be incorporated. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of ways in which because environmental justice came from Black activists, both, both mostly actually in rural communities, um, you know, pushing against things like coal plants or um, waste facilities going in to their, their communities or polluting their streams and, and cities not being concerned about it. There's, there's still a lot of ways in which environmental justice didn't become a conversation in the way that it did until it was picked up by, uh, you know, I would say middle to upper middle white residents who then, you know, adopted it and kind of promoted it into what we see now. Um, but, then, but then a lot of those roots have been lost. And I think with some of the recent work, like the book, The Color of Law, um, and the author escapes me, but, you know, he's a scholar. He's done a lot of work on digitizing and making map, like segregation and red line maps available so we can actually see and be connected to the way our cities were organized around race, um, even around, you know, anti-Semitic policies. And I think a lot of that is bringing into light things that were either intentionally forgotten or intentionally ignored or unintentionally forgotten just because of um, who, who, were, who the people were that were making those decisions. Okay, and we'll all uh, allow one more question. Uh, Andrea Gerlach, I'm not sure where Andrea's from, but I'm glad she asked a question. Have you thought about adding a set of in-depth cases to your study so you can get at some of the dynamics that you can't see in city plans, like implementation, changes in policy, role of different actors? Yeah, um, so I'm actually in the process of putting together a grant proposal right now to do just that uh, with a couple colleagues. And we are going to be looking at uh, the relationship with green infrastructure and health equity in particular, and thinking about both um, trying to measure, you know, particular locations of green infrastructure and mapping some of where these these comprehensive plans and strategic plans have emphasized um, prioritization and efforts and how that aligns with um, health metric data. And then we're also proposing to do uh, five in-depth case studies that will include interviews with both, um, for now, nonprofit organizations as well as city planners to try and you know, get at 
some of those perceptions from both sides of how these decisions and practices are actually impacting the, the health equity efforts um, being made within the minoritized communities. And then, you know, ideally, um, the next phase of that, I would love to be able to interview residents and, um, you know, similar to, to Yuna, do some research around both behavior, but also attitudes and perceptions and thinking about do, do the ecosystem services that cities are um, kind of promoting as benefits of, of GI match the, the particular services or relationships that residents themselves have to those spaces. That's great. Now there are a couple more questions and we will give you a transcript of uh, what's been submitted so you can respond to some of those that we didn't have time for. But I just wanna close by thanking you for your seminar. That was outstanding. Thank you. And to both you and Yoon Ha for doing what's really difficult to do, which is condensing a very complicated project into 30 minute talks. So thanks everybody for joining and stay well and have a good week. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Lena.